there, there are quite a few authenticated cases of man-made artefacts being found in uh, rocks which are thought to be very old, especially coal seams, for example. It's, it's quite commonplace. What tends to happen is that conventional geologists take these artefacts and dismiss them immediately. They say they must be wrong. They couldn't possibly be of that age. Well, I suppose there are two explanations for these artefacts. The first is that uh, there really were people making things many, many millions of years ago, or alternatively, our dating methods are not as reliable as we think they are, and the strata are much younger. Uh, I think on the whole, the second explanation is probably the more sensible one. Uh, on the face of it, um, an artefact, human artefact, found in a layer of rock which seems to be millions of years old is an inexplicable anomaly. It's not so inexplicable if the strata isn't millions of years old and if the dating method that's being used is in fact inaccurate. And I suspect that in many cases that's exactly what has happened in recent years. We use radioactive dating techniques to date rock strata. The technique is thought to be unassailably reliable. It's thought to be absolutely accurate. In fact, many, many anomalies have been discovered which do cast doubt on the accuracy of the method. And many scientists who are involved in dating uh, and in metallurgy and chemistry and other related fields have published papers casting doubt on the accuracy of radioactive dating. But these doubts tend to be ignored by the scientific community. For example, the rate at which coal is formed is still controversial. The conventional idea is that coal is formed very slowly over millions of years and that basically it's age that determines the formation of coal. In fact, there's quite a bit of evidence in the field that coal might be produced from wood by pressure alone. For example, uh, modern timber pilings and bridges have turned into a, a low rank of coal. Um, the Ohio, Ohio coal seam in the United States the rank of the coal increases as you get as the coal goes further and further underground, as the pressure increases. So it seems that there is some evidence that pressure alone might generate coal in a relatively short space of time. Now, if coal can be produced relatively rapidly, what about the other rocks of the Earth's crust? Perhaps they could be formed relatively rapidly as well. This is complete heresy. This is one thing that orthodox geologists would not accept. And yet there is mounting evidence that some types of rock can be formed very quickly in catastrophic conditions. The effect that this has on our picture of the age of the Earth is that the Earth could conceivably be younger than the four and a half billion years that it's customarily taken to be. And if that's the case, then there has been much less time available for life to evolve on Earth. And the Darwinian mechanism, which requires billions of years to work, is looking far less probable. There are many methods of dating that have been suggested over the past 50 years or so which don't rely on radioactive techniques and which some of which suggest that the Earth could be younger than we customarily think. For example, uh, meteoric dust comes into the atmosphere every year at quite a substantial rate. Now if the Earth really were 4,500 million years old, there would be many billions and billions of tons of meteoric dust on the Earth's surface. And the dust, by the way, is very uh, easy to identify because it has 300 times more nickel content than terrestrial dust does. But this dust isn't present. It's been suggested it's been swept into the oceans and incorporated into ocean sediments. But of course, the ocean sediments are available to us in the form of the sedimentary rocks that are exposed all over the Earth's crust. And there's no sign of the meteoric dust there either. So where's it gone? Um, that's at least one measure which suggests the Earth could be younger than it presently is thought. The chief, method, the chief radioactive dating method that's used to date the Earth is the uranium-lead method. Uranium radioactive mineral turns into lead over a long, long period of time. You measure the amount of uranium in the Earth's crust, you measure the amount of lead. That tells you, that at least conventional scientists say, that tells you how old the Earth is. Now, the figure that you arrive at when you use that technique is 4,500 million years. However, what they haven't mentioned is that uranium also turns into another substance. It turns into a distinctive form of helium, radioactive helium. In fact, practically all the radioactive helium in the Earth's atmosphere has come from radioactive decay. Now, if this method was reliable, if you measured the age of the helium in the atmosphere, it would give you the same age, 4,500 billion years. In fact, it doesn't give you an age anything like that. It gives you an age just a couple of hundred thousand years. Now, it seems to me that any technique for dating, which on one hand gives you an age of four and a half billion years, but on the other hand gives you an age of just a couple of hundred thousand years, that technique has to be at least very unreliable. Well, <clears throat> that raises the question of why exactly would they choose the age of 4,500 million years in preference to the age of a couple of hundred thousand years? And 
the honest answer to that is in order to make Darwinism work because unless you have billions of years of time for natural selection to take place in, Darwinism is inconceivable as a mechanism for evolution. Critics who've attacked my book um, have um, alleged that I think the Earth is only 10,000 years old. Well, I don't think that. Um, what I've said in the book is that at present, methods of dating are so unreliable that it's impossible to say with any confidence how old the Earth is. The answer to the question, how old is the Earth, is the conventional answer is that the Earth is of immense antiquity, four and a half billion years. I have a suspicion that uh, the Earth may prove to be somewhat younger than that. Um, there is a small amount of evidence from a number of different sources. I've mentioned a couple of them, meteoric dust, uh, radioactive dating, but there are other um, indications as well that the Earth could be less than four and a half billion years, and it could be substantially less. One American scientist has pointed out that it is quite conceivable that the materials of which the Earth is made could be four and a half billion years old, but that doesn't tell us uh, the date of the formation of the Earth. And it's quite conceivable that the Earth could have been formed much later than that. The real reason for the, the great antiquity of Earth, this four and a half billion years figure which keeps being mentioned, is that uh, Darwin's theory of evolution is essentially a theory about time. What it says is that uh, in the primeval ocean, billions of years ago, a single-celled organism came into being quite naturally, spontaneously. That that organism then evolved by a process of random muta genetic mutation and natural selection, it, first of all into invertebrates like jellyfish, then into fish, animals with backbones, then into amphibians which came out onto the land, lived partly on land, partly in the sea, then finally into reptiles and ultimately into mammals of which we're a representative, the highest form of life if you like. Um, the four and a half billion years is essential to that theory because these changes are thought of as happening at an agonizingly slow pace. Maybe nothing will happen for a million years, then a tiny change will occur, a tiny mutation will happen, which will make the amphibian go a little further up the beach, become more land-dwelling, and hence be ultimately become a reptile. These changes are all conceived of as being minute changes to the genetic material. And therefore, Time is absolutely essential to Darwinism. Darwinism is a theory of all about time. It first and foremost requires billions and billions and billions of years. Without that, the theory simply couldn't exist. And so over the past hundred years, since Darwin's book was published, the age of the Earth has been pushed back further and further and further in time. And every scientific discovery has appeared to confirm this great age. In fact, they're all in remarkable agreement about how old it is. I say remarkable because um, the contraindications, the contrary evidence, is simply ignored. Darwin's theory is, um, I think it's been accepted so well because it's an immensely powerful tool of explanation and we humans love to have things explained because that's what science is all about, isn't it? Explaining the world to ourselves. Darwin's theory appears to explain how we got here, how all living things got here, how things change, how we all arose from a common ancestor, how the earth itself came into being. And it's very satisfying to many people to believe that they have a natural explanation to all those questions. That, I think, has meant that to, to a large extent people have not questioned the theory quite as thoroughly as they should have done. They have not bothered to deal with the anomalies that have arisen in the ev evidence. And uh, quite naturally, when anomalous evidence has been discovered, scientists have tended to put it to one side to think, well, when our overarching theory is extended in future, it will ultimately be able to explain this. The trouble is that the anomalies have been building up. They haven't just been swept under the carpet. There's now a mountain of them. And the mountain is threatening to topple over and swamp the theory completely. The, the, the key problems with Darwin's theory are that, quite simply, there isn't any really solid empirical evidence. It's conjecture on conjecture, supposition on supposition. They're all very plausible, they're very rational suppositions, very rational conjectures, but they are still conjectures. And I find it ironic that for most of this century, Darwinists have acted and spoken as if they had already delivered conclusive proof to us of their theory. Well, in fact, that's the last thing they've done. There is no conclusive evidence of Darwinism. The evidence seems solid, but as soon as you start to investigate it, it just melts away. The, the idea is that uh, the theory is basically in place, that there are just a few gaps, we'll fill those gaps in sooner or later. But when you come to examine the concrete examples that are given, that are taught in schools and colleges, that most people who've been, in, who've been educated in a developed country in recent years have been given and have accepted, you find that they're not quite what they seem. 
let me give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> Probably the most famous example is the, the, the peppered moth. This is a light-coloured moth which uh, lives in the northern counties of England and between the years 1850 and 1900 when the trees were darkened by atmospheric pollution from factory chimneys the moth changed from a light grey colour to a dark grey colour so that it could remain camouflaged on the tree trunks because the birds eat the moth. Well this was described, this process, it's even been given a, a name by Darwin, it's called industrial melanism and it was described by the director of the Natural History Museum, Sir Gavin de Beer, as being an example of evolution and even natural, history, natural selection taking place in man's lifetime. And obviously, if that were true, it would be very powerful evidence. Well, when you look at the peppered moth, you don't need to be a scientist to be able to see that what's happened is that originally you had a lot of light-coloured moths and a few dark-coloured moths, that the light-coloured moths have died off because the trees have turned dark, and that the dark-coloured moths have flourished at their expense. Now, if Darwinists want to call that natural selection, they're entitled to do so. But nobody could possibly believe that that is a mechanism that could explain how one species could turn into another species. And that is what evolution is all about, not about moths changing colour. In the first edition of his book, On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin made a very interesting observation. He said that he could see no difficulty in a race of bears taking to the water, becoming completely aquatic in their way of life, and ending up uh, looking like creatures, as he said, as monstrous as a whale. In other words, a bear, like a polar bear or a grizzly bear, could turn into a whale, or a whale-like creature, given only enough time, given millions of years and natural selection. Bears could become whales. Now, the interesting thing is that in later editions of his book, he removed this claim. He'd obviously thought about it, thought better of it, and realised that it couldn't be substantiated with evidence. Now, it's fine for an author to change his mind. All authors change their mind. But the, the significance of this is that the idea that a bear could turn into a whale is the central core idea of Darwin's theory. This is the whole of his theory. So when he removed that example, he was removing the very essence of his book, that one species could turn into another species by natural selection given enough time. Now, no Darwinist today would be rash enough to stand up and say that a bear could turn into a whale. But that is what they believe, or at any rate, that's what they teach in schools and colleges. And the, the idea is unsupported by evidence today, just as it was in Darwin's day, when he removed the example from his book. A, an interesting question is, how did Darwin approach his own theory? How did he arrive at the theory? How did he publicise it? He was a very, very thorough researcher, and he considered many, many possibilities. He considered some uh, ideas which are anathema to modern Darwinists. For example, he he gave credence to the idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. He wrote about a father who'd lost his fingers in an accident and, and the, had a son who also had missing fingers. So he was willing to entertain a range of ideas. But um, I can't help thinking that if Darwin were alive today and he saw what had been made of his theory, the, the modern neo-Darwinist theory, I think he would be horrified because the modern theory is quite antithetical to this openness, to this willingness to consider uh, every aspect of living things. It, the modern theory is uh, a theory of blind chance and nothing more. The one interesting aspect of Darwinism is that it's, it isn't restricted to evolutionary biology. In fact, the idea of evolution has been exported into many, many other fields. You hear astronomers talking about the evolution of stars, and you, you hear people talking about the, the evolution of geological structures. I've even heard people talk about the evolution of religions, if that isn't a contradiction in terms. Um, I can't help wondering just if Darwinism is not supported by evidence or experiment in biology, what justification is there for applying it to other fields? Darwin approached his ideas originally uh, in the spirit of a true investigator. He was very thorough. He entertained many, many different ideas, not just simply uh, natural selection. He considered other possibilities as well. He recognised that nature is complex and that living things are complex. He was, in many respects, he was a tentative uh, researcher. Uh, that contrasts very sharply with his descendants today, the Darwinists of today, who are absolutely certain and absolutely uh, rigid in their mechanistic, reductionist view. Life is simple. Life is just a matter of chemistry and statistics. I can't help thinking that Darwin would have been horrified to see the theory that bears his name today.
Darwinism has got problems at many levels, and one of the levels is that it, it really isn't supported by the man and woman in the street. I, the majority of people feel that there is some form of direction in life. I think most people feel, for example, that they do have a moral conscience, whether or not they're religious. They, they feel that they have a freedom of will, that they're able to decide how to act, that they're not simply pris prisoners of genetics and statistics, that, that, uh, and that, that one person can make a difference, for example. Now, all of these are completely anti-Darwinian ideas. One person can't make a difference. We are just prisoners of our genes. The, the modern Darwinian view paints a picture of life as being mechanical, cold, soulless, without direction. But the man and woman in the street don't see life in that way. Um, one scientist, one biologist, said to me recently that uh, uh, working in biology today is almost like working in Russia under Brezhnev, that uh, people have one set of beliefs that uh, work, but when they go home at the weekend to their families, they don't see them as pointless machines, they have a completely different set of beliefs. Some people think that uh, the failure of Darwinism to appeal to and communicate with ordinary people amounts almost to a failure of science itself, or certainly a failure of the life sciences. And to some extent I think I go along with that. Science, uh, we, we the community employ scientists to do our difficult thinking for us, but we also employ them to explain the world to us. Uh, if biologists have failed to explain the world satisfactorily to us in terms of mankind and uh, his place in the universe, then that is a failure of science. One of the problems with the acceptance of Darwin's theory is that most people feel intuitively that there is only one alternative, and that's creationism. And to many people, that's an unacceptable theory. Of course, to many religious believers, it is an acceptable theory, but equally there are many people to whom it is a preposterous explanation. People want a naturalistic explanation of how the Earth came into being and how life evolved. And on the face of it, there simply isn't an alternative to Darwinism. Well, that really is, to a large extent, because the alternatives have been kept very much in the shadows by orthodox science. And perhaps surprisingly, there are half a dozen good alternative theories. There is one sense in which Darwinism uh, and creationism, the alternative theory, uh, can coexist in the sense that Darwinism doesn't actually explain how life originated. It simply explains how one kind of animal can turn into another kind of animal. So you could say that uh, Darwinism and creationism could go hand in hand, and I dare say that for many people with religious beliefs, they, they can, two beliefs can coexist. More recently, some Darwinists have actually sought to explain the origin of life itself, the process of the living appearing from the non-living by Darwinistic processes of natural selection. Darwinism, strictly speaking, doesn't offer an explanation of how life originated. That's a mystery. It's left unspoken. Darwin himself, in a private letter to a friend, conjectured that maybe there was a warm puddle somewhere on the Earth's surface and that life, a few chemicals got together and that spontaneously the first microorganism came into being. Um, that's been a very popular idea for the last hundred years, but interestingly, no scientist has yet been able to actually synthesize anything from scratch, any kind of living uh, being or any part of any living molecule. Nothing has been synthesized, despite uh, a great deal of optimism on the part of microbiologists. So I think maybe Darwinism, uh, it, Darwinists are conscious of the fact that there is a rather gaping gap in their theory right at the beginning. One valid question would be, is there any evidence for a biblical flood. Well, in the literal sense, there is, because we know that in 1922, the British archaeologist, Sir Leonard Woolley, was excavating the city of Ur in present-day Iran, and he found evidence of the flood. It was an immensely thick deposit. It was 100 miles long, 400 miles wide, and he discovered uh, human artifacts both underneath this sediment and on top of it. So this was clear evidence of a biblical flood. Um, however, um, creationists believe that uh, the, there literally was a flood which engulfed the entire world, and they point to the sedimentary rocks, which do cover practically the whole um, surface of the Earth to an immense depth, as being the remains of that greater flood. Um, it has to be said that that is one interpretation of the physical evidence, just as Darwinism is another interpretation of that same physical evidence. And really, there isn't any conclusive evidence one way or the other. How did I come to write The Facts of Life? Well, at first, my interest was purely in geology. I wanted to collect rock and fossil specimens. 
that made me begin to question the evidence, the evidence that I was seeing in the museum. And I wanted to uh, find out for myself exactly what evidence there was to support Darwinism. Were the things that I'd been told at school and in college, were they really true? My own daughter, Julia, was just starting school. She was going to be taught the same information. Was it right or was it wrong? Well, I spent 10 years in total looking at that evidence again, and I wasn't able to find any one thing that I could say for sure was true about Darwinism. When The Facts of Life was published, I then realised what a can of worms I'd opened up because I was immediately accused of being a kind of secret creationist, of somebody who had a hidden agenda. It seemed that uh, scientists found it impossible to believe that any rational person could seriously question the theory that they believed in and had believed in all their lives. And I encountered the most intemperate, uh, well, um, I was called stupid, loony, that I was, I was told that I was writing drivel, it was suggested I needed psychiatric help. Um, uh, sci prominent scientists were wheeled out to barrage me with personal abuse um, a as a way of just doing away with this, uh, this troublesome journalist. In a way, I almost sympathise with some of my critics because uh, they found it literally impossible to believe that somebody could seriously question Darwinism. They found it literally impossible. They were locked in so far to that view that they just couldn't uh, interpret the evidence that was in front of them in any other way other than as being Darwinist. And to them, any attempt to criticise Darwinism had to be the work of either a madman or a creationist. There was just no other way. I think they were unable to conceive that there was an alternative theory because Darwinism has somehow worked itself into the fabric of our whole scientific and educational system. It's almost the backbone, really, of our scientific thinking. In the life sciences, there just is no alternative theory. It underpins everything. I think also there is a sense in which they're afraid to open themselves to new possibilities just in case that uh, there's one chink in the armour that is going to bring about the unravelling of the whole fabric of science. Some people have said to me, how can you criticise a theory if you, can't, if you don't have something to replace it with? Well, I don't accept that. If the emperor hasn't got any clothes on, then the emperor hasn't got any clothes on. It's not my fault. Uh, a lot of people are rather prone to shoot the messenger because they don't like the message. It seems to me that if Darwinism is wrong, then somebody has got to point the finger. I suppose if you asked me to evaluate Darwinism, I'd say that there is a certain amount of weak circumstantial evidence in favour of natural selection having some influence on evolution. But if you ask me to say, can this account for the origin of species, that's the question that Darwin was trying to answer, I'd have to say, no, it can't account for the origin of species. Natural selection is significant in evolutionary terms in one sense, and that is that it can account for variation within a species. For example, how you can have a light moth and a dark moth, uh, and how one can change it to the other. Uh, you could also point to the uh, Darwin's finches in the Galapagos Islands where they say that there are 14 different species, ad each adapted to a different island. Actually, they're all members of the same species. Is there any evidence that the rocks of the Earth's crust have formed rapidly and all at once rather than slowly over billions of years? Well, yes, there is a certain amount of evidence and ironically there's a piece of it standing right outside the Natural History Museum in London. There you'll find there's a fossil tree, it's maybe 30 feet tall. What does this tell us? Well, if a tree is going to be buried and fossilised in something that's going to become rock, it obviously has to be buried all at once, otherwise the tree will simply rot away. Anybody can see that. Uh, this tree, in order to become fossilised, had to be buried in 30, 50, 100 feet of sediment very rapidly. And yet the scientists who work in the Natural History Museum continue to believe that the rocks of the Earth's crust had to be formed very, very slowly over billions of years, just tiny amounts of... Uh, sediment being deposited each year. There's plenty of other evidence of rocks being formed relatively quickly through apparently some kind of catastrophe. Uh, for example, on every continent there are beds full of the bones of millions of animals. And you can contrast this with cases that we know of where millions of animals have been killed but haven't turned into fossils. For instance, on the Great Plains of America there were 60 million buffalo when white settlers arrived. They were all killed in a very short space of time. But there are no buffalo beds forming on the Great Plains. Those animals, after they were killed, they were simply eaten by scavengers. When you look at buildings like London's Natural History Museum, it looks almost like a cathedral or a church, and in a way I suppose it is a kind of cathedral or church, or at least it's a temple to Darwinism. Inside you have all the exhibits, the exhibits that are meant to show that Darwinism is true. 
I've looked in that museum and many other museums, but I haven't been able to find the evidence that conclusively proves that Darwinism is true. Um, but many, many people go to worship at that shrine, and many people do believe in Darwinism. They, I suppose you could call it a kind of religion. People come to museums, like the Natural History Museum, to have their questions answered. Is man related to the apes? Do man and the apes share a common ancestor? And when you look at the exhibits in the museum, you'd think that the question had been answered decisively, yes, we are related to the apes. What the museum doesn't tell you is that the exhibit is an interpretation of the fossils. It's a point of view, it's a Darwinian interpretation, and you won't find any other interpretation, either in the Natural History Museum or any other museum. Let me give you one example, the famous Lucy skeleton that was recently found in Africa. The few bones that were discovered have been restored or interpreted as a missing link creature, half human, half ape. But it's important to bear in mind that those bones can be and have been put together in different ways to show different creatures. For example, an extinct ape who's not related to humans at all. The, the creature that's represented by Lucy, Australopithecus, is in fact the only so-called missing link that stands any chance of being recognised as a human ancestor. But as long ago as the 1950s, the eminent zoologist Sully Zuckerman did a statistical analysis which concluded that Australopithecus was an ape-like creature and not a human-like creature. Yet Darwinists continue to believe that Australopithecines, like Lucy, are our ancestors. Darwinists have promised us a missing link and so they've got to deliver, they've got to come up with one. Uh, any missing link will do, it seems. Uh, every so often a skeleton is found in Africa, its uh, discoverers describe it as being the missing link, the headlines come and go, and then later on that skeleton, th those bones are reclassified either as human or as ape. And so far the missing link is still missing. Forbidden science sounds like a contradiction in terms, but um, what I mean by it is this. We're all familiar with the fact that Galileo was tried by the Inquisition and compelled to recant his belief that the Earth went round the Sun. Now that's not what I mean by forbidden science, that's really human nature, because uh, we all of us tend to reject the new. But the members of the Inquisition that tried Galileo refused to look through his telescope. They refused to look at the evidence that would have told them he was quite right. And that's what I mean by forbidden science. It's the refusal by some scientists to look at the facts in front of them and evaluate them. Let me give you a really great example of scientific rejection. It's meteorites. In, in the 18th century, science decreed that meteorites didn't exist. They were completely unreasonable. Anton Lavoisier, who's regarded as the father of modern chemistry, said stones cannot fall from the sky because there are no stones in the sky. And museums all over Europe were compelled to throw away their meteorites as superstitious relics of the past. As a result, you won't find any meteorite in any museum anywhere in the world that's older than about 1800, except one huge one that fell in Germany that was just too big to get rid of. One of the fundamental premises of Darwin's theory is that a species can, if it evolves long enough, turn into another species. Now this central idea is contradicted by every single plant and animal breeding experiment of the last 500 years. Every animal and plant breeder knows that there is a limit to the extent to which an animal or a plant can be changed. Ultimately, the line becomes sterile or it simply reverts to the original type from which you've selected. This has even been given the name. Ernst Mayer, professor of zoology at Harvard, called it genetic homeostasis. And that simply means that there is a barrier beyond which evolution cannot pass. I find it extraordinary that the world's biologists continue to believe in the infinite plasticity of individuals when they know perfectly well that experiments show that it simply can't happen. A good question would be, what would it take for me to change my mind to become a Darwinist? Well, the answer is relatively easy. The whole Earth's surface is covered with sedimentary rocks, and in those rocks there are fossils. It ought to be possible to go to those rocks and to find a sequence of fossils, one species turning into another species turning into another species. In fact, it ought to be possible for the kids at the local kindergarten to do this on an afternoon's nature study at the local quarry. But the world's greatest paleontologists, with the resources of the world's greatest universities at their disposal, have failed to do this, and they've been looking for more than a hundred years. One of the things that I found uh, in looking around the cliffs of Britain, one mystery that I discovered was why was it that you could find fossil sea urchins in the chalk which were 
regular fossils, they'd been petrified, turned to stone. But you could also find the same sea urchin, which was filled with flint. Flint is supposed to be a hard material. How did it get inside? Well, the idea is that at some stage it must have been soft and jelly-like. But how do you square that with taking millions of years for those rocks and those fossils to form? Doesn't that suggest that somehow the flint fossil was formed relatively rapidly? It was questions like this that made me examine a lot more closely the evidence I'd been offered for Darwinism and just accepted. What I found was that there are too many unanswered questions of this sort, too many mysteries, too many anomalies that have been just pushed to one side in the hope that sometime they'll be answered. I've spent 20 years now looking at the geology and the paleontology of Britain. I've collected thousands of fossils. I haven't found the answers that I'm looking for.